Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. How should we view the economic results released on Monday? What are the key lessons India needs to learn from the second surge of the virus to ensure the same mistakes are never repeated again? Those are two of the issues I shall raise today with the former governor of the Reserve Bank, and now a highly regarded professor of finance at Chicago University, Raghu Ram Rajan. Dr. Rajan, before I broaden the discussion, let's start with the state of the economy. On Monday, the government released recent GDP results, and they show that during quarter four of the last year, the economy grew by 1.6%, which is better than what most people expected. And over the course of the whole last year, it shrank by minus 7.3%, which is not as bad as the government feared. How do you view that outcome? Well, uh, to some extent, it has been overtaken by events with the second wave of the pandemic, of course, setting the economy back again. I mean, the news is, 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 has some good sides and some bad sides. The good sides, of course, is the overall number. The bad side is much of this was uh, obtained through government spending growing. But if you look at uh, consumption, which is what will be needed to sustain demand going forward, that grew at a very bleak three, three point something percent. And, and that's sort of the worry that uh, uh, many of our households, especially the poorer ones, not the richer ones, but many of the poorer ones are stressed as a result of the pandemic. Their purchasing power has been much diminished. Many of them are indebted. And uh, so uh, to get the economy really back on track over the medium term, uh, we need them to come back uh, to have uh, a sense of confidence. And the worry is the second wave, which we've just seen, disrupts that further. It, and it may spread to the uh, middle class as well as the upper middle class, which has been quite free in spending in the earlier rebound. Let's then pick up on some of the impact of the second wave and some of the things have already been hinted at by you. The Center for Monitoring the Indian Economy has put out some pretty distressing details about the collapse in consumer sentiment as well as a sharp rise in unemployment. I'll take consumer sentiment first. According to CNIE, since the last week of March, it's collapsed by 15% and CNIE says over 90%, in fact 97% of Indian households have suffered a fall in real income. How worrying is this? Very. Uh, I mean, this is a tragic uh, occurrence, of course, in, in terms of lives lost. Uh, but the impact of the second wave seems to be much more widespread uh, than the first wave, uh, you, you know, much beyond the uh, official numbers of deaths and, and cases. Uh, everybody seems to know somebody who has died. Um, you know, there was a survey done by Prashnam, uh, which suggests that, uh, you know, something like 17% of the people surveyed had lost uh, someone. Uh, now, I don't know what that means in terms of how large a family they're thinking about, but that's a huge impact. That's on par with the impact of similar surveys in the US, which suggests that, you know, around 19% of the people surveyed uh, uh, had somebody in the uh, near family die. And when you multiply that to get an estimate of the deaths that have occurred, it's, it's huge, uh, certainly relative to the official numbers. Now, there's a lot of variance from, uh, you know, depending on the source, New York, New York Times has a, has a number, uh, somebody else has a number. But the point is, this has been very impactful. So, take the, the direct calamitous effect of the pandemic and then take the fact that, uh, of course, states are going through lockdowns, perhaps less dramatic than the one we had last year, but that is affecting livelihoods. And uh, if people are not coming out to spend, uh, you know, your uh, sabjiwala uh, has, a, has a problem in terms of income. Uh, and, and so when you put it all together, uh, this could have a lot more uh, negative effect on sentiment partly because people are aware of the kind of health hazards that are around. They're going to be a little more careful about their savings, especially the ones that have moderate buffers. And so going forward, uh, this will have an impact on consumption. We, and now, you know, I'm hopeful that uh, we are nearing the bottom, but we need to be thinking about how we get out of this 
uh, looking forward, uh, very important. I'll come to that in a moment's time, but let me put to you one more very worrying and distressing statistic made public by the Center for Monitoring the Indian Economy. Unemployment shot up in May to 11.9%, and it was only 8% in April. And when you dig deeper, you discover that in May, 15.3 million jobs were lost. And that's after 10 million were lost between January and April. And that means during the first five months of this year, over 25 million jobs have been lost. Right. How bad is that? It is bad. I mean, those numbers uh, are, not, uh, are not small. Uh, of course, we saw in the first lockdown, uh, if you looked at the numbers then, uh, it was uh, much bigger in terms of jobs lost. Some of these jobs will come back. Uh, uh, many of them are because uh, mobility has decreased. People are consciously staying at home in order to not spread uh, uh, or, or um, you know, get the, uh, the virus. And, and as a result, the uh, jobs, you know, for example, the street vendor or the, uh, the restaurant worker, those jobs, uh, you know, um, don't exist anymore, at least for a while, till people start frequenting uh, crowded restaurants again. So some of that will come back. But some of it is permanently gone. When you the small enterprise closes, when uh, you know the restaurant closes, they're not going to come back in a hurry. And so we have to think about a prolonged period of uh, relatively weak employment un unless we take serious action. And, and, uh, and uh, the, the range of actions start first with, let's contain the pandemic as quickly as we can, but bring all our resources to containing it. And then let's think about vaccinating as quickly as we can so people feel confident that they can venture out of their houses and many of these jobs start coming back. And then we have to think about repairing the economy. And finally, uh, you know, even as we're doing all this, we have to think about the reforms we need if we are to get back to anywhere near the path of growth we had pre-pandemic. Uh, other countries are, are doing that. China is back to the pre-pandemic growth path. But we have a long way to go. Even at the end of this year, if we grow by the 8 or 9% that people are thinking, we will still be 8 percentage points below the pre-pandemic path. And the pre-pandemic path wasn't great. We already were below what we were doing in 2015, 2016. So the loss in terms of... Um, our you know, potential, where we could be, is huge. And we really have to think about revising our, our growth model if we are made to make a dent in that, to create the jobs. Not just the jobs that were lost, but the new jobs which are required because we have 10 million people uh, you know, coming into the labor force uh, every month almost. Let's take up those four critical issues that you raised one by one, and let's start with the immediate crisis and then move on to talk about what we need to do to revive the economy and how we should, in fact, tackle reforms to get us back to the pre-pandemic growth path. But the immediate crisis is the collapse in consumer sentiment and the sharp spike in unemployment. Now, as far as I can tell, all that the government has done is to offer five kilograms of grain to the beneficiaries of the Food Security Act. Is that sufficient or is a lot more needed? Well, uh what we have as support, by the way, it should be 10 million a year rather than 10 million a month. Uh, but, but if, if what, what uh, we have is uh, a rural support in the form of Manrega, and you can see the Manrega roles picking up hugely, suggesting there is stress. People want uh, the support that Manrega offers, and they're going for it. We don't have a comparable form of urban support. And we need to think very quickly about whether we should have one. I mean, we should have used the year uh, because this was apparent after the first lockdown that when the migrants went home because they had support uh, at home, if nothing else to Manrega, but they don't have support in the cities. So uh, that's one problem that those 
poor in the cities don't have any uh, you know uh, support and and uh, you know there are ways we are making cash transfers but we need to see if everybody is covered and whether they gain adequate cash transfers we need to up the cash transfers to the very poor because their livelihoods are being impacted and we continue to be impacted as we have periodic lockdowns until the virus is dealt with that also means food support which you talked about has to be extended to such time as we are still combating the virus but equally important is combat the virus now how do you do that uh, well you need to bring all your resources to bear for example we hear horror stories of medical facilities in rural areas being inadequate there are pictures of even you know uh, medium sized cities in uttar pradesh and madhya pradesh with hospitals full of people in the wards uh, but also on the floor waiting around to get treated can we not bring more resources to those places as mumbai and delhi find that they have spare medical resources because they have dealt with the virus can we not move uh, doctors our really uh, our hearts should go out to those hard working doctors and medical personnel who've helped us this time but we need more of their help going forward uh, similarly can we bring the most afflicted patients to the places where there are icu spare uh, this requires central effort to combat the worst effects of the virus to prevent additional deaths are we doing enough here i mean we saw with the oxygen uh, uh, sort of requirements that uh, you know there was chaos for a little while until we started trying to manage it can we do more on the other aspects and of course there's a big issue of the vaccines can i on the vaccines point this out everyone says that the best stimulus for the economy would be a mass vaccination campaign the problem is it's now crystal clear that the government's first target of vaccinating 300 million by the end of july is going to be missed and it's going to be missed by a huge margin as a result of which very very few people are prepared to give any credibility to the second target the government has set which is to vaccinate every adult over 18 by the end of the year and people don't believe it a because we clearly do not seem to have the right number of vaccines and it's unlikely we will and secondly few people believe we can vaccinate at 8 million a day to reach that target so if we I, I, are able to do it what will that mean for the economy because by the way it looks as if we're not going to do it well uh, first i think the uh, the lack of preparation on the vaccines uh, is certainly Uh, something that is really devastating uh i mean we should have been able to add up our requirements for the vaccine and know we need to procure these much i do remember that serum corporation was 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 trying to get the orders from the government knowing that it had commitments abroad but of course uh, somebody doesn't seem to have paid attention to how much we needed and how we could generate that both from our domestic producers and internationally we should have been out there getting the vaccine so that we could be more confident come out of this more quickly recognizing that we probably would not have uh, been able to contain the virus yeah. i i uh, you know just just to uh, add to what, can i ask you this sorry. it's not rocket science that we could have calculated with these that we don't have the capacity we knew that last year in may and june we could have easily ramped it up we didn't we also knew that you need to buy in advance buy and risk buy practically every leading country did it we didn't in fact we did yes. our orders till january and we placed minimal ones for 10 million so would you say that beyond using the word devastating this has been irresponsible well uh I, i you know we can find lots of words to to describe this it is a failure of governance it is a failure of government and uh the question we have to ask is uh you know when the time comes we need to look back and ask why it happened uh and and we haven't done that enough for some of the problems we've had in the past and and the failure to recognize our failures uh creates the conditions for more failure and 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 it is important we look back but but now the time is really about how do we get out of this and this is where i think you know the center has to take the lead 
on procuring vaccines, on uh, investing in our vaccine producers, on pushing them to move faster. I mean, this is one place where the Trump administration did a lot, uh, probably uh, the one uh, sort of important success story it had. And it's, it's important that we learn the power of the central government. Many vaccine producers will not deal with state governments. And of course, state governments competing with each other to buy vaccines is pushing up the price of vaccines. The central government has clout and it has the ability to see on an overall all India basis what we need. Ability to state governments is the wrong thing. It needs to take action. And it's also a central government responsibility. It needs to centralize to some extent the idea of what resources we have and move them to the places we need. Let me ask you two more questions to do with the economy before I move on and broaden the discussion. It's not just the economic impact of the lockdown and the horrible virus that has to be contended with and for which the government needs policies, but there's also a lot of concern, I imagine internationally as well as in India, that the horrifying, frightening spike we saw has created a sense of panic, a loss of confidence, and that will have a behavioral impact on people's attitudes, on people's perception, and in particular, on how households and investors view the future and what decisions and actions they take. How concerned are you about this behavioral aspect of the change in people? Well, it, it is hard to predict what how it will uh, sort of evolve uh, once the pandemic is, is over. I mean, in the United States, you see that, you know, despite the horrors of what happened in New York, etc. Uh, you're seeing people now sort of being more willing to put the pandemic behind them. But but I think the uh, the question for us going forward is is really how do we come out of this in a way that gets us back to our levels of growth that we we, we had earlier, and and I think we need to recognize we should be working even now on moving the economy forward uh, to the place uh, uh, we need to be. Uh, take, for example, something like education. We've got uh, tens of millions of kids who've been, uh, you know, at best able to follow their classes on a cell phone. Uh, that's a terrible experience. Uh, and remember, many of these kids weren't even learning well when they were in the physical classroom. Uh, imagine what they're learning if they're trying to do it on the cell phone. The poorest kids have the least access to these kinds of resources. So um, what we will see when we come back is lots of kids who were in third grade, who've forgotten what they learned till then and now are effectively in first grade. How are we going to give, bring them back if we put them in fourth grade when they come back? and they're actually learning at the level of first grade, the dropout rate effectively uh, is going to be huge. They're not going to really be able to keep up. And that is going to be disproportionately concentrated in the very poor. What are we thinking about in terms of remedial action when the schools come back? That's something we should be thinking about now. Uh, similarly, small and medium enterprises, tons of them have built up debt. The ones that are still surviving, many have closed. Uh, what are we going to do about the debts they've built up? Uh, are we just going to waive them or are we going to negotiate them down? What processes do we have to negotiate them down? Now, the RPI has been quite uh, sort of um, com you know, compassionate in, in offering forbearance, etc. But forbearance kicks the problem down the road. Eventually, somebody has to pay the piper. Somebody has to pay the debt holder unless you renegotiate it. Do we have the process in place to do that? Are we preparing? So forget the past. What about the future? Oops, pandemic future that uh, we need to think about. And this is all about repair. Can we repair the damage that's been done to the economy? Even while right now, support to people, we should also be working very hard to contain the virus and we should be bringing in the vaccines in order that our population is vaccinated, the sooner we bring it in. And here cost is not that great a, a, an issue because the value of vaccinating the entire population quickly and increasing economic activity 
far outweighs any spending we will do on the vaccine. So sometimes we are penny wise and pound foolish. We should be thinking about procuring as much as we can. Of course, unfortunately, there's not that much left to procure given how late we are. But last point, we need to be thinking about the vision for the future. I mean, as I said, 10 million people coming to the labor force every year. I mean, what are we doing to uh, both to remedy what we've lost, but also to create the employment for these people? We were not growing fast enough to employ these people, which is why we have these agitations by the Patels, by the Jats, because you know, land is no longer enough to, to occupy them. They're looking for jobs. Everybody wants a government job because you don't see the private jobs coming. What are we doing on creating new jobs? What is the vision that we have? And unfortunately, vision is something we don't see right now. You're absolutely right. But I know that this is something you think about. So why don't you share with the audience what you think the government should be sketching out as a vision? Spell out for the audience the top three, four elements of what you think would be the right vision and include in that some of the reforms you think we should be putting in place so that vision can be realized? Well, let's start with what's, what's going wrong. What's going wrong is extreme centralization of governance, a distaste for experts, and an abhorrence of criticism. So what that does is create a kind of echo chamber when you hear from people like you. And that does very little to discipline government decision making, right? Uh, everybody's saying to see great hole within the uh, realm of the government. And, and, and so as a result, uh, you know, when you haven't procured the vaccine, nobody is saying, uh, boss, we need to do it. We need to do it quickly. Uh, there are plenty of smart people in government, but they're not speaking up. And that's because, you know, the dominant narrative uh, doesn't really want alternative opinions. Uh, but let's move on. Let's say that we have changed the style of government to embrace different opinions, to hear from the experts, to understand how we make uh, you know, better decisions as a result. What is it that we need to do going forward? What is the kind of, uh, of, gov of uh, country we want? I mean, if you think about where we have the greatest capacity, it's not so much in manufacturing. Uh, yes, we can improve our logistics. We can start maybe competing with Bangladesh and Vietnam in a better way than we've done in the past. Uh, but really, where we have a lot more expertise is in the services. And there are enormous possibilities for providing high value added services. I'm not talking about restaurants and hotels. Uh, that too will employ the, uh, the moderately educated in our country if we expand those, if we expand tourism, uh, if we expand, for example, rural uh, industry. But we can also generate enormous value through high value added services. Think about providing financial services for the rest of the world. Uh, think about providing uh, consulting services, right? Now, what we need for that is a much stronger education system. We need to build that. Uh, we need these institutions of excellence, but not just five or six. We need hundreds of them to educate our, our, our population and to give everybody a chance. But it also needs a style of governance. Today, for example, uh, why do countries distrust Chinese uh, you know, firms such as Alipay? If Alipay comes into your country and provides financial services, you wonder how much of this is actually of my purchasing uh, data is available to the Chinese government. How much is it that they can see if they want to see it? Right. So uh, one of the problems with uh, financial services, with uh, uh, high value added services provided by an, a, a firm in a country with an authoritarian government is there are no checks and balances on it. Right. And so you wonder, there's a lot of fear in the United States about Chinese apps coming in because they may uh, use the, the data that they get against the American people. India in the past was much more trusted as a democracy with rule of law, 
with a judicial system which can stand up to the government and which can protect priv uh, privacy of people's data. We have a wonderful uh, sort of, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, proposal on how to ensure privacy of data. If we implemented that and protected the privacy of people against intrusion by government, that would be a very strong signal to the world that India can be trusted on these kinds of We've market lost. for those kinds of services. We lost you briefly, but literally just for a second, let me quickly pick up on the two big points you said. At the core of your vision for India, First. not manufacturing, but a building up of financial services, of services per se, and yes. giving value added to them. You're talking about increasing consultancy, increasing financial services, and that, you said, not only requires a vast improvement in the educational system, but an open, transparent government with checks and balances. A government that is trusted, a government that is open, and a government that is willing to change. The exactly. Vision one. What are the chances that we're going to get that sort of government? And what are the chances that we're going to get the improved education? Because on that front, there seems to be no movement in India at all. Well, I, I, I think the... Um sort of the new education policy, uh, sort of if, if we can roll that out in an effective way, gives us a kind of blueprint uh, on uh, what needs to happen on education. Of course, we need to allow far more funds to come in. We need to bring in some of the foreign universities in addition to the Indian, you know, uh, supporting some of the strong Indian universities. We need more freedom of speech within our universities because after all, you're not going to attract strong academics uh, to come to those universities if you're suppressing what they say. So, uh, you know, this is a package deal. You can't pick and choose. You can't say I want the best universities, but then, uh, you know, suppress uh, speech. Uh, you cannot say I want the best IT services and in, uh, at the same time, send a policeman to Twitter to complain about what's, what's going on there because, uh, you know, they have a policy which, uh, which flags some uh, sort of news as fake news. I mean, the image that we have, that we had, was of a democratic ally, uh, a trusted democracy. I think bit by bit we are eroding that. And that in a sense, is also eroding our future. Uh, we cannot afford that because we need every scrap of growth that we can get in order to come back to where we should be. This doesn't mean kowtowing to the world. You can be independent, you can be strong, you can take the right decisions. But these decisions are not just right for our economic future. They are right also for our political well-being. And uh, we have to be uh, sort of, we have to see that the two are linked. Uh, oh, you know, if we allow um, freedom of expression, if we allow debate, if we allow free speech, we're also going to get the kind of criticism, etc., which tells the government to course correct and not make the kind. See, we lost you again briefly, but only briefly. Let me put this to you. I'm going to quote what you said. The image we had, and you used the past tense, was of a trusted democracy. You said we're eroding it, and as it erodes, we're eroding our future. Explain to the audience just how much damage, not just in the eyes of the Western press and the Western public, but importantly, in the eyes of Western investors whose money we need, has been done by things like the Twitter incident, by things like the attack on critics, whether they are activists or journalists, or whether they are just ordinary people who are on social media making innocent comments which the government doesn't like. The damage done by the erosion of our institutions, all of those together, does it put off investors in addition to giving the country a bad name in the media? Well, I, I, you know, I, I would first worry about what it does to us uh, directly. A and, and yes, it does affect investor sentiment into India, uh, uh, a strong, powerful, 
uncontained government. Uh, you know, no investor wants to be at its mercy. We can see that, for example, uh, in the government's refusal to accept some of these arbitration claims. And now we have uh, uh, we have cans going after Air India planes across the world. This is not news that we need. But I think from our own perspective, it is absolutely essential that we have free criticism, free debate, because that keeps the government uh, on the right track. If the government doesn't hear criticism, it always thinks it's on the right track, and therefore it can go very far from the right track before it course corrects, as evidenced by what happened with the vaccines. If we had uh, somebody keeping on asking the question, where are the vaccines procured? Do we have them? Perhaps the government would have woken up much earlier. And, and uh, similarly, uh, I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, so criticism is in our own interest. But also, uh, let's move to the foreign investor. The foreign investor thinks that they have a chance in India, if they have a dispute with the government, of using our wonderful judicial system, uh, if uh, they believe it is independent. But to the extent that the judicial system continues supporting uh, the powers that be on every decision, they start asking questions. Uh, am I confident that my rights will be protected in that country? Or will it become like China, where the judicial system essentially is an arm of the government? So uh, these things matter. These, these things matter for investment. Uh, these things matter uh, also for India's image. Uh, I mean, I still... Uh, in the United States, um, India is seen as fundamentally a, a good democracy. But, you know, some of this news is eroding uh, people's faith uh, that India, uh, you know, when we talk about the uh, coalition of democracies that Biden wants to build, uh, often a question comes up, is India part of that coalition or not? This would not be a question that was asked in earlier times. And that is seriously being asked in America. It's not just journalists being irritated. It's seriously being asked. Well, I walk in some uh, circles which, uh, which you know, are part of the circles of power. And it is a question that is being asked. Now, it will never be asked openly because uh, the United States does not want a rift with, uh, uh, with India. But, uh, but I would say that the question is being asked more than it was asked in the past. I want to put to you, Dr. Rajan, two widespread impressions in India about the way we've handled this crisis and the way in our handling, we've exacerbated it and unfortunately done so with our eyes wide open. Firstly, there is a huge view that India believed, not just the government, the people as well, industrialists and a lot of others, that we were an exceptional country, that we wouldn't have a second wave, even though we knew that every country in Europe and America did, and the second wave was a lot worse than the first, but we convinced ourselves it wouldn't happen. And as a result, the prime minister in January was boasting to the World Economic Conference that India had contained Corona effectively. The BJP passed resolutions praising the prime minister for defeating Corona. Do you think that this attitude of exceptionalism and the triumphalism that it produced was a terrible mistake. I, I think you said two things there, exceptionalism and triumphalism. I mean, every country believes it's exceptional, uh, right? It's, it's different. And that's, a, that's not a bad, bad view that uh, you believe in the future of your country. Uh, you believe you can do great things. That's, that's great. It's the triumphalism that becomes a problem. Uh, if you believe you're exceptional, you have a great future and you work hard in going towards that, in preparing yourself, uh, you know, you can move mountains. That's what South Korea did. Uh, it grew from a poor country to a rich country in the span of a generation and a half. We can do that in India, but we cannot be triumphal. We cannot say we've arrived. We haven't. We have a long way to go. You have to look outside at the world and see how much more the rest of the world is doing to recognize what a long way we have to go. So if you looked around and said, well, maybe we had a good first wave, uh, we didn't get affected so much, uh, maybe there are some immunities. 
But that means we have to move faster on preparing for the vaccine so that we come out of this with the minimum damage. That would be a good thing. And if you said we're exceptional, we have a great distribution system, we have dedicated doctors, we have a great voluntary system, let's bring them all together to roll out the vaccine in a fast, expedient way, using our fantastic drug manufacturers who, uh, you know, we're going to incentivize to produce these drugs, these vaccines. That would be a great resolution. Uh, and there you're benefiting from the exceptionalism in a positive way. Complacency uh, coming from exceptionalism, triumphalism coming from exception. We know everything there is to know because we learned it in the past. That is the way to ensure we go nowhere, we go backwards. And I'm afraid that sometimes that is the outcome. The second concern I want to raise with you, and again, it's connected to the way we handled this terrible spike that we are just about recovering from, is the fact that we now know the government was advised by its own body of scientists that the new variants were worrying they could easily lead to an exponential rise of cases and that advice was ignored. Instead yeah. of taking protection, we decided to hold huge political rallies, huge kumelas. The health minister of Assam said there was no need for a mask. The chief minister of Uttarakhand said faith in God and Mother Ganga would protect us. Is this disregard for science? And I suppose it's not just science, it's disregard for expertise. Is this another failing we have to correct? Well, uh, again, uh, we have to look at uh, this not as an isolated incident. I mean, remember the demonetization, uh, which happened without us preparing enough money uh, to replace the currency that we had taken out, which created chaos for a few months, right? We are not prepared enough. There are parallels between how that decision was taken and, 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 and the preparation we had done and what is happening with the vaccines. And this is why I say we should go back to understand what went wrong if we're not to repeat mistakes over and over again. But I want to caution you on one thing, which is to assume this is a failing of the current you know, powers that be and, and just them. It is also a system which allows the kind of centralization, the erosion of institutions that you talked about, the ability to ignore experts, and the ability to shut down criticism. This has happened in the past. But even today, when you look at the center and compare it with some states, some states have similar sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, features of governance uh, happening there. It's not that the center is unique in this, uh, and it's not that uh, you know every state is a paragon of virtue. We have some excellent uh, sort of examples from states of management of the virus, but they don't all come out with shining colors, nor do, uh, you know, can you say that uh, some of the state chief ministers are much more democratic in spirit. Uh, not all of them are. Uh, and so what we need to look at is the system itself. Why does it succumb periodically to this, uh, you know, um, authoritarian populism? Uh, why, what kinds of checks and balances do we need to bring into the system? Uh, how do we prevent the excessive centralization within the country at the center, within states at the state capital? How do we, uh, you know, protect the rights of the press? to make sure they don't become poodles, again at the center, but also in the states. This is a systemic issue, and we can uh, sort of uh, see it crystallized in the current leadership, but it's not just a their doing. Uh, we've done it in the past, and we do it in the states also. Can I ask you this? You have put the finger on the system, and you had a lot of convincing examples, but as you spoke, the thought occurred to me, is it perhaps even worse? Is the problem something that lies in the Indian character, in our culture, in our upbringing, in our thinking, that we accept compromises, we tolerate uh, authoritarian rule, we get riled by criticism, and often simple preparations that good administration requires, we don't do out of carelessness. Is the fault in ourselves? 
I, I think the danger is again of, of going to exceptionalism, but in the opposite direction. Uh, we are terrible. No, I, I think when you look at examples of our success, um, ISRO, fantastic public sector institution, uh, which has done wonders on very low budgets, uh, the Indian Space Research Organization. Uh, that, to my mind, reflects the best of India. Uh, and you cannot compromise on quality when you're sending rockets into space. They, they come down very fast if you compromise on quality. And so we have learned to overcome the Chaltaha attitude, the, uh, the tolerance for uh, a certain amount of uh, defect, the, the unwillingness to emphasize the need for really superior quality all the time. I think there are lots of Indian firms that have done that. There are a number of Indian institutions. But we have to give them a, a, a chance. Remember, for example, how the election commission was strengthened by TN Session, and it became a force to reckon with so that our elections became clean. No more booth capturing. Booth capturing was something that used to be so prevalent in the past. We changed that. However, if we start sending you know, uh, an election commissioner because he protested, we send him abroad because we can't stand him on the election commission anymore, you get a more pliant election commission. There's no point saying the election commission didn't stop the elections because uh, uh, COVID was rampant. It was their fault. No, they listen to you. So if you have weakened the institution, you cannot complain that the institution is not standing up to you. That is a feature of what you did. Not, uh, so so you have to, we have to think about why we allow, I mean, the, uh, our, our strong institutions, we have still a number of strong institutions. We have to ask why we allow them to be eroded. Why do we don't have more of a public outcry when these things happen? And, and uh, you know, ultimately this affects us. It's not about the foreign investor. It's not about the rest of the world. It is about India and its ability to secure its place in the world without emphasizing um, all these aspects, institutions, um, you know, uh, the uh, trustworthy advice of experts and all that, um, you know, uh, our future is, is uh, grimmer than, than it could be. And I, I do think we have the possibility of a glorious future, uh, not because of our exceptionalism, but because we will work hard towards it. We're coming to the end of this interview, but I want to put two more questions to you. You probably remember when the elections happened in 2014, there were a lot of people saying India needs a strong, determined leader. Would you say that actually it's not strong, determined leaders? What we need is strong, resilient institutions and a commitment to make them work at all costs. We need both, right? Uh, uh, we need strong, determined leaders who are willing to articulate a vision. And vision needs thought. How do all the pieces fit together? How do they fit with the Indian ethos? Where are we going? And, and, and do we have the resources needed for that? Or do we need to prepare more? I mean, all this has to be thought through and sold. We need political leadership which sells that vision. And that vision, I believe, has to be one which takes all Indians together, not you know, segregate one set and say, they're not Indians, they're not part of our vision. It has to bring all of them together. At the same time, we have institutions that are trying to find their own, um, an election commission, a, a reserve bank, a competition commission, which is very important. We need to check and balance the unbridled growth of certain industrial groups also. So these are all part of what we need to make India work. I think they have to work together and not work at cross purposes. So in a nutshell, just to sum up that answer, would you say the problem is that India suddenly has become a country without a vision? It doesn't know where it wants to go and therefore it doesn't know how to get there. We're slightly floundering in the dark. I mean, I, 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 I saw a piece by Yogendra Yadav a couple of days ago asking uh, for that vision. I see him as a, as a you know, thoughtful, very thoughtful political commentator. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think that uh, we certainly know that, uh, you know, Nehruvian socialism ran its course. Uh, 
Uh, we, after that, tried to muddle through through a, a, a sort of, uh, yes, we need more markets. Uh, yes, we need stronger institutions, but we didn't really articulate how they fit together and how they fit together with India's social uh, side, which is, which is extremely important. I think we need to recognize that going forward, uh, we need both the, uh, the uh, sort of opportunities afforded by open markets and integration with the rest of the world. But we also need to emphasize that India's strength has been the debate, has been the exchange of ideas, and has been, uh, you know, what sometimes is not recognized today, our unity in diversity. We bring different visions to the table, but integrate them into a broader vision. I think we need to rediscover that. Uh, we need both the dynamism but also we need the tolerance and the respect for one another, uh, the decency, the plain basic decency of, uh, of uh, working together and uh, working together without uh, demonizing each other. If we can do that, and uh, I hope we find leaders who can, who can rebuild that in us, uh, I, I don't think there are any limits to where we can go as a country. Let me end. By quoting to you something Pratap Bhanu Mehta wrote, I believe, yesterday in the Indian Express. He said, not so long ago, India was a country that believed its future was bright and glorious, and we were realizing it with every single day. Suddenly, over the course of the 15 months this pandemic has lasted, the prospect that faces us is of slower growth, rising poverty, a shrinking middle class. In fact, the Azim Premji University has pointed out that over the last 15 months of the pandemic, 230 million Indians have fallen below the poverty line. We were so proud of lifting 270 above it, 230 have now sunk down. And the point he was making is the point I want to put to you. Have, are we suddenly in this terrible position where a future that we took for granted would be bright and glorious and sunny, suddenly has clouded over and the prospect looks grim and gloomy. I think um, adversity can, uh, can certainly constrain the mind and make you feel uh, really um, you know, down. Uh, I do hope that we have stronger efforts at containing the virus uh, and we have um, you know, uh, much better efforts at procuring the vaccine. That could change. Uh, the envi environment in India. But I, I think the point that we should not ignore is that we haven't been doing well for some time. The pandemic sort of brings everything to a, uh, uh, to a crescendo. But uh, we need to rethink our future going forward. What is the India that we want? And how do we make it possible? If the pandemic triggers such rethinking and makes it possible to set a, a new agenda for India, a, a vision, uh, that much maligned thing, uh, which, uh, which sort of brings together uh, the whole of India and gives us confidence uh, that we can do it. Uh, that will not be such a bad thing. I mean, adversity often brings out the best in a country. Uh, remember 1990-91 when we put in place a bunch of reforms, uh, which uh, effectively uh, created a new India. Uh, we need that. Uh, and, and I keep saying, uh, more than Atma Nirbhar, we need Atma Vishwas. We need to believe in ourselves, uh, but not in, uh, as you said, triumphalism. We need to know that we can do it, but we need to put in place the various things that are needed to make us uh, achieve that. And that means work every day as hard as we can to make that vision possible. It means strengthening our universities. It means, uh, you know, running the, uh, you know, talking to the, um, you know, something as mundane as creating resources for the government by talking to the banks that you want to privatize, talk to the unions and bringing forward the privatization we keep talking about, but never actually do, but bringing it forward in a way that makes customer service better, but also em makes employees more confident about their future. I mean, these are all things we can do. Uh, I mean, it seems like a small thing, but it's part of that larger vision. We need to do yesterday what we plan to do tomorrow. How do we do that? Um, I think it's possible, but, but we, need, uh, we need to take stock and, and articulate that new vision. 
that is a positive moment to end on. This is a dark moment, but we have the capacity, we have the reserves, and we can find the vision to move ourselves forward. The only thing is that effort is one we have to make, and we have to make it unsparingly in every day. There are no shortcuts. I see you're nodding, and I assume that means you agree. Uh, absolutely. The uh, worst thing we can assume is that we've arrived or what you just said, there are shortcuts. There are no shortcuts. We have to work harder than the rest of the world, but we can. And you can see it by looking at our medical personnel, uh, our voluntary organizations, all of whom who've risen to the challenge. If they can do it, the rest of us can also do it. I don't want to misquote him, but that reminds me of Robert Frost. The woods are lonely, dark and deep, and I have miles to go and promises to keep. And we must remind ourselves that this is a journey we cannot falter on. Thank you very much for an interview that was not just eye-opening, but I think even at times truly inspiring. Take care, Dr. Rajan. Stay safe. Thank you.